Assalamu alaikum, dear guests, colleagues, and friends from Turkey, from all over the world. Welcome to Istanbul. I would like to share a lot about this beautiful city with you today. And I hope, I hope that you enjoy your stay here in Istanbul. I hope that you have time to take a, you know, to take a walk around the city, especially along the Bosporus, and to visit my favorite, favorite district, Çengelköy, which is um, after the night of July 15th, has become the symbol of our national pride. And the headman of Çengelköy here, I hope that he will be happy to host you all there in Çengelköy. Dear friends, it's an honor for me and for us all to have all of you with us today. You are the rare souls that instead of falling into despair, at our world's most urgent questions have dedicated yourselves to taking positive action. This is a sentiment we share. Instead of looking away from the most difficult challenges of our time, Turkey has relentlessly engaged. Whether it's the plight of the Syrian refugees, whether it's malnutrition in Somalia, whether it's the injustices in Gaza, Turkey never hesitated in taking positive action. While the West turned a blind eye to the immediate crisis in Syria, Alhamdulillah, Turkey and its people opened its doors to three million Syrian refugees. As the Ummah of our beloved Prophet, we look at the current refugee crisis from the focal point of Hijra and the lawful relationship between the Ansar and Muhajirin. This is their homeland too. Despite the political, social, and economic challenges, from very early on, we are doing our best to accommodate our war-torn brothers and sisters. And recently, during Ramadan, the President announced plans for Syrian refugees to become Turkish citizens, having full access to health care and education. In the lack of much international support, I have to admit, this indeed is the blessing of Allah for our nation. Alhamdulillah, time is infinity. Dear friends, a notable Muslim scholar, Ibn Haldun, he says, geography is destiny. Indeed, the geography Turkey is destined to live, destined this, this land and its people for struggle, hard work, and diplomacy. Over the last 14 years, Turkey has strengthened its economy, solidified its democracy and democratic institutions, and maintained political stability. Those of you who have followed Turkey, and the speakers before me have also told us, we know that we have a dismal memory of queues nearly every 10 years blockading standing as a barrier before our democracy. During the uninterrupted AK Party period though, Turkey gained its internal stability whereby the state attained a more inclusive social policy approach to attend to the needs of its different ethnic and religious minorities and suited its aggressive secularist policies to embrace its religious citizens. AK Party governments also struggled to eradicate the tutelage regimes within the military and the judiciary and strengthened them as independent civilian bodies. Dear guests, government's strength always rooted in its faith in the Turkish people and their preferences. While bolstering its democracy, Turkey also continues its struggle against devastation made by separatist groups in the region to resolve the grievances of its people, especially in southern eastern parts of Turkey. We believe that if Turkey is strong, the region is strong. Our region is strong. Let me mention a remarkable statistics with you. According to the Humanitarian Assistant Report 2016, Turkey ranked 
the highest with regards to its spending for humanitarian assistance, as percentage of its gross national income, that is. Over the years, Turkey supported the needy communities in Somalia, Pakistan, Myanmar, Afghanistan, and Syria, regardless of their ethnic and sectarian belonging. This would have not been possible if Turkey has not undertaken all the progressive reports over the last 14 years. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is this environment of stability and democratic consolidation and the democratic will of our people that have been targeted by the brutal coup attempt of July the 15th. In the backdrop of the very biased, one-sided information outcast by global media outlets, I can only assume that it's hard to grasp the actual severity and the damage that we faced during the coup attempt. So allow me to share some thoughts and experience from that horrible night of chaos and violence. I, I said that Turkey was continuing its struggle with terrorist organizations like the PKK within Turkey and Daesh along our border as these were continuing, Turkey faced maybe the biggest attack on that night, this time coming from the members of Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization, FETO, that's how I will continue uh, calling them, infiltrated into the military ranks. On that night, my family, my, fa my parents, and some ladies of my father were on holiday at a seaside resort at Marmaris on the Aegean coast of Turkey. We were having a quiet rest, spending more time with the kids. Yet in the evening of that ill-fated night, we received a phone call from a relative. In an anxious tone, he told my dad about a rumor that a group initiated a military upheaval and blockaded the roads running up to the Bosphorus, the Bosphorus Bridge, that is. Believe me, we did not give a chance that such rumors could have any truth since the days of coup attempts in Turkey were left far, far behind. But it was a matter of minutes when my husband also received similar reports from Ankara, including news that F-16 jets were flying over the city. My three children, my 10-year-old son, seven-year-old daughter, and um, then eight months old uh, baby boy. They were all with us at the time, and I realized the anxiety and fear in their eyes. That was the fear of the unknown. I realized at that moment that they knew so little about the words they overheard on the phone that we were speaking at, at the time, like uh, upheaval, council, Q, maybe Q, intelligence, F-16 jets, chief of staffs, what they mean. There was just anxiety and, and the fear of that unknown. While I took them to a separate room to comfort, I remember my father's decisive attitude. He was unmoved and confident that together with our people, we would push the plotters back. He stood firm against the unlawful demands of the army he reached out to his people through a FaceTime call on live TV broadcast and invited them into the streets to protect democracy. Some of you may actually wonder why he called people to the streets. What sort of a leader would risk the lives of his people? That was actually exactly the black propaganda that was put forth by the fetal linked people over their internet broadcasting. But let me make clear, friends, that military cues occupied our collective memory in Turkey for quite a long time. The 1960 cue is especially notable for we still carry the shame and regret of not going out to the streets to protect our first democratically elected prime minister.
Adnan Menderes and his friends from being hanged by the military junta. Then the fear mongering and character assassination tactics of the junta have suppressed the people and their resistance. Talk, talk to anybody who was on the streets on the 9th of July 15. You will recognize how this collective regret led them to stand up for their first democratically elected president. I remember a woman shouting in the front lines the next morning, my parents wept for Menderes. I wept for the loss of Özal. Özal is another popular um, Prime Minister um, President in Turkey. And she continued, my children will not cry for Erdogan. We will not let that happen. That was the spirit that overturned the plot. The fact that Civilian people went out on the streets also made it clear that they have internalized the vision of a politically and economically independent Turkey. A Turkey that, that the AK Party governments under the leadership of Erdogan have advocated over the last 14 years. The reforms undertaken to emancipate the judiciary, the military, the economy from the tutelage regimes was truly reflected in the reactions of thousands of people on the streets that night. Going back to the night, I recall, the, I, I recall that after some discussions with his 80s, the president rejected the idea of sailing into the nearby Greek islands without, without any hesitation. He didn't even give that a chance. During the same hours, the Western media sources were distributing fully fabricated reports that Erdogan took refuge in Greek islands or in Germany. He decided to go to Istanbul instead to be with the people already on the streets, despite the obvious danger. TV stations have started broadcasting images of the tanks on the Bosphorus Bridge a speaker was reading a Q statement that you've seen, as old, as cold, as the ones read on radios and TVs during the 1960s, 70, 71, and 80 Qs. Private channels continue to broadcast the images from the bridge and making live phone interviews with the prime minister, the ministers from the cabinet and MPs all of whom were making clear statements that a small but insidious fraction in the military have indeed started an attempt to seize the government, but that they were prone to lose, for many top-level generals actually sided with the government. They assured that the government and the democratically elected parliament was intact. As a citizen, I am proud of the courageous and brave MPs from all political parties who have run to the parliament, opened a general assembly meeting while F-16 jets went as far as to bomb the parliament. This is the second time since our independence war that the parliament has been bombed. I will never forget that horrible night in which we were transferred to the airport with a low altitude flying helicopter and then reaching to Istanbul in a plane that could be brought down at any moment by the pushes, realizing the potential risks we might face in the rest of the night and increasing anxiety of my children. I asked them to look at my eyes. I asked them if they saw any fear in my eyes. And they said no, but then they reverted saying, but we are still afraid. And I said, keep looking in my eyes and never forget what we used to talk with you all the time this, you know, the verse from Surah Yunus saying that if Allah touches you with harm, then there is none to remove it. And if he intends any good for you, there is none who can repel his virtue. And I reminded them that we were on the good side. Luckily, the world for them is still 
much more about the world that's drawn in cartoons that the good people seem to win all the time. So I said, just you know, calm down. We are on the righteous side. Don't worry. We'll be fine, inshallah. They showed an amazing strength through the night. Despite the fact that my father was informed on the carpet bombings at the Turkish parliament, headquarters of security forces, National Satellite Broadcasting Center in an attempt to silence TV and radio broadcasts, military tanks driving on the streets of Istanbul, Ankara, and other major cities, he never hesitated at any moment on his firm decision to fly to Istanbul. Later on, we learned that a group of highly trained soldiers attacked the resort we were staying in. Only 15 minutes after we left, two police officers were killed on the spot from among the presidential security forces. May Allah bless their souls, inshallah. Our people, though, were even more decisive to put down this attempt. Young and old, men and women, regardless of their political attachment, walked up to the tanks that night. Safiya Abla, Safiya Bayat, is one of those women who stood up against the tank. I, I still can't believe how she did that. In Ankara, people surrounded the presidential complex in Beştepe. They blockaded the roads with all the peaceful means they had. Municipal administrations marshaled their work machines and city buses in front of the military quarters and significant civilian locations like the parliament, the presidential complex and on. Something that has never happened before in our history took place that night. The people went to the streets to take back their democracy. They had felt empowered, empowered enough in their sense of nationhood and the sense of selves to stand up together for what they worked so hard to build, a thriving democracy, a thriving nation. Our people stood with their bare bodies in front of the tanks, F-16 jets, heavy artillery of the army. I remember a citizen trying to actually shoot down an F-16 jet. That was a fact, <laughs> he really tried it. That was the kind of spirit, that was the kind of iman, I have to say. These people had only flags in their hands and let the plotters know that enough is enough and gloriously put an end to the coup attempt. We lost 241 civilian and innocent lives during the clashes with the rebellious terrorists wearing military uniforms while close to 2,000 people got wounded. May I invite you, my friends, those of you from the US, how would you feel if the Brooklyn Bridge was attacked? Those of you coming from the UK, how would you feel if the building, the parliament, the British parliament was attacked? Those of you coming from France, how would you feel if the Eiffel Tower was hit? I really wonder how, how would citizens in these countries would react? How would the states react? And please imagine, how would the international community react if these were the case? Immediately after the end of the attempt, as would any other democratic state do, the Turkish government also undertook measures, of measures that would lawfully deal with those who have threatened the lives of millions of our citizenry as well as jeopardizing the millions who depend on Turkey's stability in the region. In order to more effectively and speedily restore order, the parliament approved a three month state of emergency. Actually, the cabinet and the, the president, they have uh, passed a, a three month state of emergency. Western critics who have welcomed the French state's extension of state of emergency, as far as I know, over a year now, immediately launched a campaign to portray President Erdogan as using the failed coup attempt to further solidify power and to witch hunt opponents. Let me reassure you, dear guests, the rule of, the rule of law is in effect in Turkey. 
everyone who took part in this bloody coup attempt will have to answer within the court of law and justice is what our people demand. There is no purge in Turkey. Each person who are suspended, detained, or taken into custody is done so by the justice system, and everything is transparent. International community is welcome to come and observe the process. Dear friends, FETO is not a conventional terrorist organization, if there is any conventional organization, terrorist organization. Its method is infiltration, takia, and disguising under the cover of religion, interfaith dialogue, educational initiatives, business and philanthropic organizations. I'm sure you will hear more details about this despicable cult and how it organizes and mobilizes its uh, followers throughout the two days you'll be spending in Istanbul. But let me make one thing clear. FETO is not a recent phenomenon. It has started its activities in 1970s, namely as a religious community, but have systematically grew over the years with its attitude to side with whoever is politically powerful and with its followers infiltrating key state institutions through cheating on state personnel selection exams and the likelihood, the entrance exams to the military, etc. FETO members within the judiciary, the police forces, the military, educational system, and the parliament functioned within a chain of command that was headed by Gulen and aimed to hijack democratic politics. AK Party's struggle with FETO started around 2012, immediately after they realized how this organization, this cult, corrupted politics in Turkey using insidious methods like illegal wiretapping of thousands of citizens and blackmailing as their interests necessitated. That's why there is no question in the minds of Turkish citizens, regardless of their political attachment, that FETO is behind this plot. Testimonies by junta soldiers, other tangible evidence from the night of July 15th, clearly shows that FETO masterminded and administered th this plot. We need these facts to be understood clearly in the West, my friends, at least among our Muslim brothers and sisters. Dear guests, securing justice on this sort of a colossal crime will necessitate a long but decisive effort within Turkey. But it will also ne necessitate support from the international community. Unfortunately, on that front, we see that international community is resisting understanding the level of devasta devastation that Turkey went through. We would expect to receive strong condemnations of the coup attempt by our friends abroad, but must but, but, but must admit that most of them failed to do so. The Turkish state has demanded from the US to extradite Gulen to Turkey in, accord, uh, in order for him to be brought to fair trial in Turkey. And this is a due process. And let's be clear that FETO gains its power from its international network as uh, Professor Kandur has expressed. And these Gulenist institutions are no less harmful for their hosting countries than they are for Turkey. The vast charter school system FETO runs throughout the US, per se, is no less of a danger for the US or Americans than they are for the Turkish people. Dear esteemed guests, <coughs> July 15th cannot be understood fully and correctly within an Orientalist Westernist discourse. That night, women like Safiye Hanım, Sherife Boz, Sherife Boz, who actually got behind the wheel of her truck as soon as she heard about the coup attempt and went on the Bosphorus Bridge with her 10-year-old grandson and resisted the tanks on the Bosphorus Bridge. These women have challenged all the existing Orientalist narratives about Muslim women and their status in society. 
The nonviolent resistance of thousands of citizens before the deadly tanks and F-16 jets have challenged the narratives on the relationship between religion and democratic participation. Five million people from all political parties and lifestyles who have gathered in Yenikapu and you saw that meeting that was one month after the nightly vigils, democratic watch, we used to call that. That meeting in Yenikapu, one month after the failed attempt, shattered the stories in, we in Western media that our society got polarized. We need to go beyond the narrow Western and Westernist frameworks and tell our own story. We need to develop our own terminology. As Muslims all over the world, we need to forsake the sectarian narratives imposed on us and instead embrace each other on the basis of our shared Muslimhood. Dear brothers and sisters, we believe that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his servant and messenger. That's enough to get us together on the so same common goals. We must do all we can to increase our common denominators rather than dwelling on our differences. We need to bring together our positive capacities to help resolve the needs of our sisters and brothers all around the world. They are looking in our eyes. As the, world's get, as the world gets increasingly interconnected, none of us are isolated from the ills that may actually come out in one part of the world. Yes, Turkey faces the threat from the terrorist organizations like Daesh or Daesh, PKK, and you can name a number of other organizations in this region on a daily basis. But can we say that Europe is isolated from the same threat? We need to question the Western narrative on Muslims and terrorism and question Europe's two-faced policy towards the Middle East. Dear friends, it's been an honor to be here to share my thoughts and experience. I think this is the first time I've actually shared my personal experience that night. So it's been a bit hard for me. Thank you for listening. And thank you uh, to the Faculty of Theology at Marmara University and Igetev for allowing us, for giving us this opportunity to come together with our sisters and brothers from all over Europe and United States. Thanks for listening and enjoy your time in Istanbul. Thank you.